Hello, uh, welcome to the Ford School Policy Talks. Um, I am excited uh, to be in conversation today with Penny Nass. Penny has just spent a day as our first alumni in residence post COVID, uh, getting a chance to talk with some of the students and then have this conversation with me um, about her role. So uh, in the world and what Penny has done since she herself graduated from the University of Michigan. So I'll start there. Penny has a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan. And since then, uh, Penny started her career in the US Department of Commerce. So she spent some time in government. She worked there for 13 years in various roles covering international trade and commercial issues. Um, she then went to work for Citigroup and the global government affairs team for six years, moving to Europe to open the company's first government affairs office in Brussels, uh, Belgium. So Benny has some knowledge about not just uh, what US government does, but global countries do and what the Europe's doing around regulatory issues. In particular, she oversaw the various legislative and regulatory issues that arose after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, currently, Penny is, Nass is the UPS president for international public affairs and sustainability. She started at UPS in May of 2012, managing the public affairs team, at, where she enhanced government understanding of UPS and the issues impacting the logistics industry. In 2014, Penny was also asked to oversee sustainability in Europe and has worked to advance Inter internal and external appreciation of the importance of sustainability for UPS. She then served as UPS Vice President and District Manager for International Public Affairs and Sustainability from January 2015 until early 2020. So first, let me welcome uh, Penny to this conversation. Um, I am excited that, that you're here. And um, you are, uh, you work for UPS, you're a logistics expert. So I thought the first place we should start our conversation is talking about logistics and COVID and the kinds of supply chain problems that we're starting to see around the globe. Can you tell us a little bit about that from UPS's perspective? Um, is, you know, what are your big fears around and, and what is the real, what's the truth on the ground around the kind of supply chain problems? Uh, that every, all of our students and alumni hear about in the newspapers. Well, first off, Betsy, thank you so much for um, engaging in this conversation with me today. I think um, I really admire a lot of the work you've been doing, and I really admire in particular the spotlight you've shown on a lot of the issues around the care economy and around child care, particularly during COVID. And I think that that's... Um, that's been incredibly impactful. And I just wanna thank you for um, the spotlight you've brought to, to that, because I think it's just, it's, it's, it's an, a huge issue that is under discussed. Um, if I could- hey, Let me just say, I will thank you for saying that. And we're definitely gonna save some time to talk <laughs> about gender issues uh, and childcare and managing it all as a working mom. Because I know you have three kids, I have two kids. So we don't just talk about it, we live it. Uh, but let's start with the like nitty gritty of you know what you what you're dealing with every day right now, which is those supply chain issues. Yeah. So at UPS, we have 540,000 employees around the world. We move two percent of the global GDP every day. Um, during COVID, we have had to navigate some incredible challenges, and it is a testament to all of our employees. Um, our pilots, our folks on the ground who have day in, day out been, been dealing with uh, huge surges of volume, as well as very challenging operating conditions out in, um, out in the world. It has been, um, when I think through some of the things that we've been grappling with and dealing with, I think about a lot of the agility and the resilience that you need to have in your global value chains, your global supply chains today. It has been, as I, I'm gonna talk about our pilots in particular, if I can for a second, because I think that there's some examples there. A pilot that works for UPS 
in order to get the PPE and some of the other equipment we needed out of China, working in the COVID related pandemic conditions has been extraordinary. We have pilots who fly around the world, but who once they land, go into closed loop systems. So they land, they're picked up by somebody wearing full PPE, who takes them to a hotel, they're not allowed out. They uh, remain in that room until it's time for their flight back. That could be a couple of days. Um, they eat all their meals in there. They're not allowed to take a walk. They're not allowed anything. And so that's been going on for 18 months. That's how our pilots are getting around the world. It's the same with the folks driving the boats. People are behind all of these logistics. And as we think about some of the challenges that are arising in the global supply chain at the moment, I think you can't take a step away from the people because it's the people that are really driving this and it's the people and the conditions in which they have to work that create um, at times what, what then are becoming some of the bottlenecks challenges that are creating the bottlenecks. It's, it's around the people and, and, and what's happening with them that, 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 that really is where some of this is stemming. You know, when you're talking there, it, it makes me think about you know, one of the things I've been most frustrated about in all the COVID uh, debate is this people being concerned that government policies to rein in COVID, whether it's lockdowns or mandatory vaccines, are you know causing harm to the economy. And the thing that just struck me is the big thing doing harm to the economy is COVID. And so, you know, it's your pilots. Yes, they're they're getting picked up in PPE and they have tough times, but there's a reason for it, right? Which is otherwise, I, I bet you must have been dealing with some of your pilots actually getting sick and having to deal with um, with their own concerns about their personal safety as they travel the globe in this pandemic. Absolutely. And that's absolutely the first thing that I think all of us are thinking about is how to protect our how the pilots are, are protecting and, and are being protected. But at the same time, there's also the, the other conditions within which we work and how do we balance that? So it's not that I think pilots should be going, you know, going out and, 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 and intermingling with the local population. That's right, we have the closed loop system in place. But the issues that do exist are, how do you make sure that those pilots are sharp for their flights, for those operating conditions, when you know these systems are, are are put in place in a way. I mean, I know Betsy. At one point, you went back to Australia, having to do two week quarantines with kids in a hotel room. Not being able to go anywhere is potentially not a, a very appetizing prospect. So, well, certainly if you're just getting doing that to get back on a plane and go back to the uh, to countries where there's lots of COVID. I, mean, I think my point was that no matter what you do, the cost of doing business went up during COVID. Absolutely. You, know, whether you take the precautions or you don't, the cost of doing business have gone up. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's also become very local. So it's if you have supply chains, you really had to know where your products were being produced very locally because COVID outbreaks were taking place, not always at big levels, but sometimes at very local levels. And that would impact your supply chain if you didn't know that. So is UPS struggling with some of the worker shortages in the United States that we, we hear people talking about? Is, I should say, maybe you don't know the answer to that question because you work in sustainability, but I was just wondering if, if they are and if they are what they're doing about it. Yeah, so I think that we're all, um, I don't have the answers to that specific question around the labor and some of the labor issues. I think that where we're, we've been, um, what we have seen is we've seen a huge um, surge in volume and that has at times created, um, like with, with all things, what we've seen are peak conditions that are taking place in non-peak periods. So there have been times, but again, our people have been working, working, hard, working hard to make sure that we're, we're meeting the demands of our customers globally and um, and looking to see, and we've been we've been doing different things to do that. But again, I don't know all the specifics about it because well, it's not my specific area. Let, let me let me ask you this because this is a question we all want to know the answer to, and and I know you've given some thought to this. 
Am I going to get my Christmas presents on time or do I need to get out there and start shopping right now? <laughs> I think that um, as, as one of my senior officials said the other day, it might be good to order Christmas presents a little early this year. We are seeing, I think there, there are some things that we're seeing. I think there's, I haven't checked what the number is today, but it was 64 boats off the port of Long Beach uh, the other day. There are some, there are some potentially some dislocations going on. Going back again to some COVID outbreaks that took place in some major ports around the world, shut down a few ports. Those ports have come back online, but again, we're kind of seeing the start and stop of some of the supply chains that are out there. And I think that um, it, it might be wise not to wait till the last moment this year for your Christmas gifts. I, I appreciate, I'm sure everybody appreciates that advice. Well, let's turn to something that's a little bit more long run. Cause I think, you know, the hope is these sort of global supply issues and the, the surges that UPS has experienced, you know, the, the peaks and the valleys, uh, that's all gonna work itself out, uh, hopefully over the next six months, maybe sooner, maybe a little bit longer. But the big question is the disruptions that are being caused by the kind of catastrophic weather events we're seeing from climate change. And this brings us to these questions, you know, what do we do about sustainability? And how do we deal with it, climate change? And I wanna start with, how do you think about it on the corporate end? I mean, this is your job, advising on sustainability. How do you marry you know, advice that's good for the planet with advice that's good for UPS's bottom line. Yeah, so at UPS, we've put in place um, just this year, we had goals, sustainability goals, environmental goals that were in effect until 2020, some until 2025. And we've just reissued um, our 2025 goals and then put in place some 2035 and committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. But alongside those, we've put in place some principles. And some of our principles have to do with always acting with integrity, um, making sure we're delivering results, not just promises. And this follows on the fact that we've been doing this already for years. At UPS, we're all about efficiency. And so the best mile is the mile that's not driven because we're efficient with the processes, the procedures, the dispatch, all of the things that go into a network business. So that's something we've been doing and we've been doing kind of forever. The next thing that we've been doing is we've been looking at and have been working on, again, for years, looking at and trialing different technologies, working on new and different things. So we have this thing called a rolling laboratory that we do. Again, we've got a tremendous network. And every day in our network, we are trialing different technologies, not all of which I can talk about publicly, but we have amazing things that are going on every day. And some of them work and some of them don't. So right now in the United States, UPS currently runs about 25% of our network is run on renewable natural gas and liquid natural gas, compressed natural gas. We'd like to get it to be all renewable natural gas. We're not quite there yet just because of supply, but we're, we're working our way up and we're, we're getting there. And this year is gonna be, we're again, taking a big leap forward. But for us, we see that as an important step forward. It's a transitional technology, but it's one that is making huge impacts and it's something we're doing today. And that's what we're committed to do is to continue to look for those things that we can do, we can scale up and have meaningful, real, tangible impacts. So I, I think, you know, the thing that is behind what you're saying is that there's lots of things UPS wants to do because it's gonna be good for UPS's bottom line. But there's other things that are not good for your bottom line because they're too expensive. So you just started talking about renewable natural gas and you and I've talked about this before. And you told me that you know, a big motivator is, are you getting a huge subsidy for that? Because it's really expensive. Um, so you just said there's supply issues, but I think that by supply issues, that's kind of a polite way for saying pricing issues. Uh, it's expensive. <laughs> And a subsidy changes how much you use. Is that right? I think that there are always, we work in, in various ways with various governments. There are different government policies that are used around environmental policies. Again, you and I have talked about this. In some cases, there's restrictions. In some cases, there's penalties. 
In some cases, there's incentives. In some cases, there's taxes. And so we look at and make assessments around uh, which technologies make the most sense for us. First off, from a reliability and service perspective, uh, we, we, we do need to serve our customers first and foremost, and that is a very important thing for us. Then once we test the technologies and we look at them from a service perspective, will this do the things we need it to do to stay in business? We then look at it also from a financial perspective as well as from an environmental perspective. Is this something that's gonna, yes, be potentially um, something that we can work with in terms of our bottom line, in terms of our finances, but also will it move the needle on the environment? Is this moving us in the right way? And so those are all things that we look at and assess from a technology perspective as we look at and appraise some of these things that are coming online from a climate change perspective. So I'm just going to uh, have to point out the fact that you use the word incentive to mean, you know, some a present to us from the government, like a subsidy. But of course, a tax is an incentive. Uh, a fine is an incentive. We change our behavior to avoid taxes and to avoid fines. But, you know, just like my kids tell me, you know, they certainly prefer rewards rather than punishments as uh, as as incentives, even though both of them might actually incent the behavior I'm looking for. So I understand the, the the corporate preference that might not always align with what's in the the public interest. But I think the clear thing is that we have to align the public interest and the private interest with being more sustainable. So what do you think are things governments could do better to create uh, you know, better incentives for companies to be able to move more quickly towards a sustainable future? So I think it's it, it depends on the different aspects work through. And I think the issues out there, there's a lot of very complicated issues out there that cut across, some cut across industries, some are industry specific. So um, one of the areas that I've been working on and there were some papers that came out this week was trade policy. How can we work on trade policy to make trade policy um, work in a way that helps promote climate change, green technologies, make sure that the right incentives are in place in terms of um, tariffs, non-tariff barriers, et cetera, with regard to some of the technologies and some of the things we're looking at from a climate change perspective. On the tax front, Betsy, I'm going to leave it more to you because I know you're, um, you have done a lot of thinking and work on some of the taxes that are out there, whether it be a carbon border tax, whether it be cap and trade, whether it be some of those. I think that there are incentives there, but I think you also need to think about how those incentives or how those taxes or how those regimes are actually executed. Because I think that sometimes some of them are quite complicated as well. And that creates some other above and beyond the financial aspects. Some of the complicated nature of some of those regimes is something else that needs to be considered and looked at when governments are putting them into place. Well, I'm glad you mentioned trade. And so one of the things I didn't say in the introduction is that you're the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Trade and Investment. And, you know, the you probably have some views on this idea that boy we should try to buy things that are locally made rather than buy things that are made far away because that's better for the environment um how do you respond to that kind of claim i think you know one of the great things that i think governments do is collect data and i think some of this is you need to look at the the, the issues around this in a way that's um really looks at the facts and looks at the data. Because I have seen some examples, Betsy, where there are locally made products that consume way more resources than something that is produced further away, but is then put on a boat and, and brought in via trade into, into a country. And I think, um, you know, I've heard different examples. I've heard an Australian lamb example. I've heard a few other examples in the past. And I think that it's a question that continues to, to, to need to be examined and looked at on a, because I think there are different examples that would result in different outcomes. As a consumer though, I have to say that um, 
even if I, I grew up in Michigan, I grew up here in Michigan. And when I grew up as a kid, you know, in the winter time, you kind of ate apples and you ate some oranges that maybe came up from Florida. And that was about it. You didn't get many other fruits and vegetables. Container shipping got invented and all of a sudden you could eat grapes and strawberries. So there's, there's the climate question around it. There's the consumer aspects around it too. And then there's the question of how do you move it? Because there are some ways of moving it that, from a climate impact perspective, may not be as impactful as some people think, versus something that's made locally. Yeah, I, that I think is just—it's such a really important point that you know you have to check your intuition when it comes to you know what's the the most sustainable and. Um, you know, you're you're roughly my age, so I hear you on the idea that you know, back when we were kids, you, you ate what was in season and you didn't eat the rest. But you know, even if we weren't importing strawberries today, we're richer as a society, and there'd be hot house grown strawberries consuming enormous amounts of resources right here in Michigan, probably if we couldn't buy our strawberries from somewhere else. And uh, you know, I it, it does require you know taking a harder look at at what is sustainable and and what isn't the uh but how do you think uh countries are going to deal so thinking back on that sort of carbon pricing what we're seeing is other countries are starting to introduce carbon pricing how is that going to affect global trade if some countries price carbon and other countries don't um so I think it's a great question. And I think you are seeing things like the, cor the carbon border adjustment mechanism being debated and discussed in Europe. A lot of discussion around what that means from a trade perspective. Is it, is it compliant with, with the GATS, with the, the global agreement on tariffs and trade? And in particular, looks at some of the specificities. It, again, it's a question that's very, very dependent on how the, re the regimes are structured. And then once they're structured, there's a, a question around, um, you know, how are they going to, are they going to be effective now that they've been structured in such a way to comply with the trade rules? What is comply? How are they going to be executed? How are they going to be, how are they going to work? Are they going to work? Are they going to send the right signals in? So I, I, again, I think the jury's out on some of this, but, um, it is something that I know is important from a domestic political consideration for a lot of countries who want to go further on climate, but have domestic constituencies they're worried about. And that's, I think, what, what they're grappling with in terms of some of this. I know that there are studies that have come out that have shown that um, some of the taxes, at least in the European perspective, would not... Um, would still contribute positively to climate. But um, again, I think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done and a lot more examination that we need to be doing around some of these regimes before we're gonna really know how compliant they are with global trade rules. Um, so, well, I mean, let's shift the conversation a little bit. And uh, you, uh, you're working on sustainability, care about uh, climate change and environmental issues and you, uh, your degree is in public policy, how'd you end up in corporate America? And is that consistent with who you wanted to be as a public policy student? So yeah, so I would say just very honestly, I was in the US government for 13 years and um, going to a topic, we can, we can pivot to another topic, I, I got divorced and I was a single mom with a child and a mortgage. And I loved government work, but it got to a point where it was gonna be challenging for me to remain in Washington DC on, on the government salary as a single mom. So I started looking around and to be honest, um, at the time was looking for some of the big US global companies who I thought um, were doing public policy work but doing it from the private sector perspective. So, um, and I first ended up at Citigroup. I was working with somebody who I had known and had worked with in the White House previously, and it was really exciting work. It was 
I'm a huge, passionate believer in international trade. I'm probably one of two people in the world today that is still a big, passionate believer in international trade. And I wanted to go work for a company where I could where I could do that. And um, City City provided that opportunity to me. It it helped me also from a financial perspective. But it was true that there was a lot that they were able to do. Um, from their from their perch as a big financial company to assist with that. Now, I, I also happen to time it maybe a little bit off in coming in two years before the financial crisis began, um, during which time we saw that, you know, again, talking about the pandemic, talking about supply chains, talking about how people look at risk and assess risk, um, you know, we th some things had gotten out of whack with regards to risk and risk scenarios and risk planning. And um, so I got to spend a couple of fun years doing that. And then um, at a certain point, UPS came calling. And I thought, great, international trade and UPS. Everyone loves international trade and everyone loves UPS. I'm what an, another great company to go work for. And I, I have to say, I get to do amazing things at UPS that help advance women's economic empowerment, doing things on delivering vaccines around the world. We do a lot of amazing things on a day-to-day -day basis that, that I think um, that are still true to my public policy, uh, my public policy upbringing and my public policy goals and the values that I, I took from my time here at Michigan. Well, uh one thing I, I wanted to tell you is, you know, you were also an undergraduate economics major. And um, well, I have been, I have a principles of economics textbook, and I'm really committed to trying to change how we teach economics. And one of the things I say um, at almost every presentation I give to econ instructors is your students are not growing up to become economists. They're growing up to work maybe in a corporation, maybe you know, working on sustainability, maybe working on trade, which is much more connected to economics, maybe working in government, maybe being a teacher. But what we know actually looking at the data is a very, very, very few students who, ever, who take a principles of economics class, like one in a thousand go on to become an economist and even Few, you know, we also don't see very many uh, econ majors who go on to become economists. So you're a great example of using your economics degree because you clearly use it, um, but not not doing it as a as an economist. And I think it's obviously clear to me you're using your public policy degree. Um, you know, one thing you said that I just want to stop and pause on because it is. I worked a lot on. Um, government salaries when I was in, in Washington, DC. And the reality about government salaries is they're more equal. So people at the top are sort of paid a little bit less than what they could get in the private sector. And people sort of in the bottom rungs tend to be paid a little bit more than what they could get in the private sector. There's a lot of benefits to that greater equality, but it's really hard to coexist in a world where there's rising inequality in the private sector and it's people in the private sector who are competing to buy the house next door to you and pushing up, you know, the cost of living around you. And so, uh, you know, your story about being sort of lured out of government in order to provide for your family really resonates um, in a, you know, in a, in a way that I think doesn't just say, well, maybe the government should pay more, but raises some questions about, like the just the out of whackness between the amount of inequality we see in the private sector versus versus government, um, but let me come back to you know what you are the ways in which you're you're using your your policy degree. You know, one argument is that you can't have every public policy major on the government side of the table because who's on the other side of the table? So. You've been on both sides of the table. Um, how does it feel to be on the corporate side? And what do you think, why do you think it's important for public policy majors to be, to think about being on either side or both sides for some of their career of the table? Yeah, so I think 
some of my role, I think, Betsy, is to, and I think the role that we all serve in public in public policy and, and why going into the corporate world is, is a good thing, um, a lot of what we do is we translate. And so business and government don't always speak the same language. Uh, they often don't speak the same language. And so, you know, I think in our roles, we end up trying to be that translator between the two. Both sides are trying to achieve certain goals, they have missions, they have things that are top of mind. And I think sometimes you, you need to help each side understand what the other side is trying to accomplish. Because sometimes um, you might be both trying to accomplish something similar, but you're saying or talking about it in different ways. And so that I, I think is something that's really important to speak to and really is something important that, that folks in roles like mine can do. Um, and so that's why I think that, you know, there is a role for public policy majors to go into the corporate world. I also think that it's just, you know, we at UPS have a foundation. So I work very closely with my foundation partners. And while we do some amazing work in our foundation, um, a lot of humanitarian work, we do a lot of work around women's economic empowerment, but because it's a foundation, it's really about capacity building. And so, but what makes that women's economic empowerment work, building resilient communities work sustainable over the long run is moving it from being in our foundation and in, in the part of UPS that's a 501c3 and moving it over to the business part. Because once it becomes part of the business, once it becomes an area, then it, then it becomes very sustainable and it becomes something that the business becomes very invested in as well. Um, you know, the, you you mentioned the communication and not really understanding necessarily what the other side was saying and um you know i think you often hear this cynical view like corporations have you know the ear of government but there is actually this other challenge which is that you, you have people who work in government who don't really understand what's going on in business and we need to make sure that those channels of communication are open um and so you know, how, how do you see the balance, again, having been on both sides of the table between undue influence from corporations in the policymaking and regulatory process versus being able to truly, you know, communicate so that better policy can be made? Yeah, so I think one thing we try to do, and one thing I try to do on trade policy in particular is I focus very much um, on trying to help our customers, our female, uh, owned business customers, our small and medium sized customers. You know, we try to help with articulating some of what, some of the issues they're facing that are impeding their ability to grow. And so there is, you know, I think there are things that we see out there where government consultations, um, government involvement in certain areas in, in with regards to women in trade, with regards to women's economic empowerment, we've seen that some government policies get developed without necessarily taking into account the perspectives or the views of all businesses. And so as a result, and, and, and sometimes that's, that's it, it goes out as open consultation, but people are busy. And as you know, women were also, some have a disproportionate um, responsibility at home in some cases. And so women's ability to contribute in some of the consultations with the way that that's being done is maybe means that women's voice is less heard or is less reflected sometimes in government policies. So one of the important things we try to do is we're trying to help get some of those voices out on the table to help make sure that the policy making that is done at least hears from all the perspectives and then is making decisions based on all of that information. And I think that that's something that's important that we all continue to try to do in our, in our, in our societies because hearing just from a few does not always produce the best results. So with that, let's shift a little bit to talking more directly about 
uh, gender. And I wanted to start by asking you if you thought that the way business was done during the pandemic, did that change how you interacted with your colleagues, with your employees? Did you learn things different? about them or how to interact with them? And how did you deal with people who worked underneath you dealing with their struggles of being like a mom at home with kids? Um, so I have a global team. So I was using Zoom before the COVID hit. And the one thing about Zoom that I think we under we underestimate is that everybody's box on Zoom is the same size. And so there is something that I think is was came out of a, what is for many been a, a very challenging and difficult situation. But there has been, in some cases, a flattening of the world. And some of my people that work for me have been able to be much more involved in certain things because we were all on Zoom. And so that helped. But as I would just say that I so I have three kids. I was at home. Um, people saw my kids. People saw my kids come on camera all the time. My kids always seemed to know that when I was in the middle of really deep, passionate business discussions, that was the perfect time to come ask me if they could get $10 for their PlayStation 4. Um, <laughs> and so, because um, so, I would tell them yes and go away because I got to finish this first. So, but I had a, a lot of, we've had a, we've had a lot of things on my team that I think really required, not just from me, but from many, you know, a very empathetic leadership style. We all were going through something. Um, we were all going through it together. We had to become much more understanding about disruptions, interruptions, what was going on. We had to, I think, have a little bit more grace and understand that we didn't always know what everybody was going through and we needed to cut everybody a little bit of slack because you just didn't know what, might really be going on in someone else's space. But at the same time, needed to check in on some of our colleagues from time to time. And I think that that became really, really important. And it was also important to make sure that we were reflecting this up and down. So I wasn't trying to present the perfect picture to my people, nor was I presenting it to the people above me either, because that wasn't what was going on in my life. I, I was struggling with three kids, trying to educate them while also trying to do a really hectic job because of what COVID was doing to our network and to our to, to all the things that we had going on, um, as well as adopting a dog, as well as trying to get out of the house and take a walk from time to time. And it was a challenge, but I think it was empathetic leadership that really came and, and really was really helpful to make sure that balance was was somewhat maintained during that period. And do you think that that is going to change you permanently as a leader? I'm sure it will. So I think of, you know, we recently went through the 20 the 20th anniversary of 9/11 and Betsy I was in the commerce department that day having to make decisions about, you know, what to do with with all the people we had in the building. We had people in Tower 6 next to the World Trade Center. Um, the, the unpreparedness we saw that day has impacted me to this day. I will, I have a list of my employees and their phone numbers I carry with me at all times because I wasn't able to reach my people that day. And that was something that really, really impacted me. Um, and so I think all of these experiences help shape us and change us and make us the leaders we, we, we will be in the future. So at least I hope. <laughs> I hope, I hope we all learn something from it. Well, I, I mean, honestly, that's, your 9-11 story is very powerful in terms of, you know, how, you know, it, it just shaped you thinking about how do I get in touch with somebody? Um, and I think so many of us forget that. Um, yeah. And um, But we all forget it. We forget, I mean, we always forget the lessons of a crisis, don't we? I mean... <laughs> I mean, the supply chain crisis we're going through today, it's the same thing we've seen we've yes. seen in the past. So I've started to get some of our audience questions that I want to bring to the table. And um, one, uh, so I'll read this out to you, is um, 
how do you think about maximizing positive impact in your career? And in which of your roles do you feel you've made the greatest positive impact for environmental sustainability? And so for sustainability to be the current role. So at UPS, we're a very large transportation company. So and we're in, we have sectors that are easier to decarbonize, like ground transportation. And then we have sectors that are more challenging, like aviation. So I think that there are areas there that um, uh, we will continue to try, and we we're, we're are continuing, but we have a huge impact to play there. And we, I, I don't think we underestimate our importance on it. So I see that the work I'm doing today is, is the one that's the most important. And for those out there that are Michigan students, I'll tell you that I didn't set out to do sustainability. I just became passionate about it. And I walked into my boss's office one day in Europe and said, we're not doing enough on this. And she said, okay, you're in charge. So be careful what you ask for sometimes. <laughs> so. Um. The uh, I, 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 that's a great story because it's actually how a lot of people end up doing things, which is they put their hand up to do it, and then somebody says, "Okay, go forward," and you go forward or you don't. Um, and with what so so, what advice would you give uh, today's public policy students about you know how how they should think about getting that first job or internship, how they should think about navigating their career? Yeah, so I think it's a great point. I, I, the, the, the main advice I would give is you need to pick your bosses. You don't always pick your, I mean, you can work on the world's most boring thing, but if you have a fantastic boss who's supportive and encouraging and they can, they can take topics and make them relevant and interesting. I started off doing anti-dumping and countervailing duty investigations at the Department of Commerce, but I had fabulous bosses who helped me transition from my, my public policy school um, academic career to the, the business world or to the, the work world. And I will still, um, I still remember them um, fondly. And ever since then to today with my current boss, I, I, I think who your boss is, is an incredibly important thing to think about. So researching that and making sure you network to find good supportive people to work for is gonna be what makes the most impact and allows you to make the most impact on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I think that's really incredibly good advice. And a lot of people might not even think to do it because you're like, how do I do that? But I think you're, you're saying, you know, you ask around and you try to gather the information you can when you're picking jobs, because I, I think you're right to say you can never do better than the person just above you. Like you can't really make end runs very easily around the people above you. So they're your cap. Um, and I, yeah, that, that, that seems really uh, powerful but, and important. But a good one will bring out the best of you too. Yes. So it's what are they getting out of you? And, and you know, the I always say that the, the best people for me to work for are, are people who already see the best in me because that makes me want to be the best. Right. So, so I, I certainly am not motivated by negative uh, comments. I'm motivated by someone who says, like, you can be more. And uh, but you you have to good advice to try to figure out who you are and who you want to be. But I wanted to come back to something you said, which is you left commerce because of family reasons. But it sounds like that's been okay. And I think a lot of people are afraid to make career choices or sacrifices for their own personal reasons and certainly afraid to say it out loud. What do you think? Should people be afraid to make those choices? Like I think I've gone through there's times in your life where frankly it's challenging to make a change so um you know health crises maybe you have family issues you have an elderly parent you have a child who needs stability you know sometimes you can make a sometimes you make choices for for i think for family reasons and and that's fine that's fantastic 
But there are other times where I think we need to be careful not to be so locked into, and particularly as women, locked into fear of taking a leap. And I think sometimes taking those leaps is when you know you, you not only have the greatest personal growth, but you also have the greatest opportunities that that come up. And I have never, I've never regretted a shift I've made. Just like, you know, I think with all things in today, the world is just changing so quickly. We've got to be constantly learning and we've got to be constantly changing. And in my own job and in the various jobs I've had, I've worked in three institutions, the Department of Commerce, Citigroup, and at UPS. But I have done multiple jobs and done multiple things in each, as well as doing kind of extensive, you know, board service and volunteer work and NGO work on the outside. And I've, I've never regretted any of the leaps I've done internally. I've learned from every single one of them. I think the other thing that I would just say though, Betsy, for family reasons is I, I remarried um, and I'm now married to uh, somebody who's a diplomat for another country. And so the other thing that comes up, I think, and will become more and more um, challenging is how to marry two careers. Um, you you happen to be with somebody who's in a similar profession, um, but marrying people that you know similar education levels, similar ambitions, and moving around, particularly with a global career, moving around the world, that that comes with needing to think about you know managing your career in a very proactive fashion because otherwise it's very hard to make that work-life balance work. I, I think that's exactly right. And, and all, you know, this issue of like, how do you figure out whose career comes first? Um, who, and, you know, I think it has to be that somebody's career has to come first in a particular moment at time. And then you just try to make sure that it's not always leaning too heavily in that one direction if you lean too heavily in that one direction, then it becomes the joint household joint optimization is keep supporting that person who's earning more and more and more and more. Um, and that's how you end up with women getting sort of sidelined. And I, one of the a fact that really I always think about is men who move physically for work, right? So you're, you're working in city A and you've got a job and you get a new job in city B and you move they get a big raise if you look at their wages. So I, I'm, I'm just looking at, you know, men who move from city A to city B changing jobs, big wage increase. Women, it's a decrease. Why? Because they're more likely to be following a spouse than they are to be making their own proactive move. And, you know, they're, they're a little tiny bit of our gender wage gap. Well, I would say, you know, one of the leaps I made, Betsy, was when I went to Citigroup, I worked for a year in Washington. And after the year, they turned to me and they said, you know, we're looking for someone to go work in Brussels, but your name keeps coming up. Would you like to go do this? I was a single mom. Um, I had a five-year-old and I luckily had a boss who asked me, didn't assume because I was a single mom with a kid that I couldn't, didn't hold back from offering me that opportunity. He said, to, he came to me and said, I think you're the best person for this job. Can you make it work? And I went home and I made it work and I went. And I have to say that from, you know, a wage perspective for me, it, it worked out well. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think also sometimes as, a, as a, again, going back to a good boss, I didn't have a boss who made assumptions. And I think that's also what holds certain people back is the, that people make assumptions about what's going to work for you rather than asking and giving you those opportunities and helping you make it work. Uh, I totally agree. And I could talk about that all day, but let me turn to some questions that people have that are more around uh, sustainability. And um, here uh, is an example. How does UPS and other logistics companies like FedEx and DHL balance environmental sustainability and consumers' desire for faster shipping? Is there any way to make these conflicting forces align? I think that's a great question. And I think one of the things we need to do as, as shipping companies is provide transparency to our customers when they make choices. So, um, and that's something that we do have. We need to probably do more of it. And we need to work with particularly the e-commerce companies around it so that when you're going and you're making your checkout, 
you're making decisions that align with the service levels you need and then the climate impact that comes with it. In some cases, it's, it can be complicated in the sense that we are seeing a move from having warehouses far away and a lot of transportation uh, of goods to having maybe shorter zone movements. So some of you may know that, you know, there are certain companies that are actually using the inventory on their floor to then ship and to ship shorter distances. That's something else that we're seeing as a trend as well. So there are things, and I would just say again, there are ways to, to, to help with faster same day shipping and to help with the climate discussion. And it requires, it just requires conversations amongst the broader ecosystem. But at the same time, we do need to help consumers make the right choices with regards to what their environmental goals are and what they should be, and then how do they want that product to be received as a result. I mean, I, mean, I think that that's a really important point because honestly, when I'm asked like by Amazon, gee, do you, do you want to delay or do you want this thing to arrive tomorrow? I'm like, well, what, what do I get for delay? And there's no information. There's nothing like, well, um, this, you know, will reduce the carbon footprint of this package or this, like, there's nothing that tells me like why I should go for that. Um, yeah, I was on the website of one of our customers the other day. I was looking at something, uh, looking at a dress. And when I went to go to the checkout cart, it told me that if, if I was willing to get the package in two weeks, it was six times less uh, carbon than if I got the package in two days. So that would change my behavior. Yeah, I, I clipped it. I made a picture of it and clipped it. This, was a, this is a customer of ours that we've worked with on this and on some of the carbon mapping and the carbon impact. And so clipped it and said, this is a best case. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good example because I think consumers just don't know. And the other thing is they don't necessarily trust. Like I can't just assume that if I say, oh, let's send it slow that it's not going to be that Amazon doesn't just deprioritize it and then it comes out of the warehouse and gets on a plane like four days later. So I think communicating with customers, because people do care about this. I think preferences are shifting. You'll see from the, you know, the number of questions I know our young students have about environmental sustainability. This is their number one issue. Even in the middle of a global pandemic, it's their number one issue. Yeah. Um, they did. There was an actually interesting question that I wanted to ask that is in, is a little bit about sustainability, but how has UPS worked to address the supply chain uh, shortage uh, currently being faced in Haiti? And has UPS worked to empower local communities in Haiti or other countries facing natural disasters to make them more self-sufficient in the face of natural disasters? So we have, and um, we have um, a lot of work we've done in Turkey more than Haiti. In Haiti, um, we've done a lot of work over the years. We've been doing a lot of humanitarian shipments recently, trying to help the situation in Haiti. And in other, in, 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 I don't know if we've done this program in Haiti. I do know we've done it in Turkey. So we may have done something in, in Haiti, and, and, but I can't specifically address it. But in Turkey and another, in, 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 in we've got a very specific program after they had their earthquake um, several years ago, where we did go in to try to work with them to help with building resilient economies. So one of the things that, again, Betsy, going back to our work on women's economic empowerment, uh, we found also there's a variety of statistics around it. I, I don't want to quote it because some of them have been challenged, but some of the statistics that we've seen and some of the work we've done has said that by empowering women and helping women enterprises in particular, you're helping to build that resilience so that when there are natural disasters, when there are um, uh, not other disasters or crises that may arise, that those communities are more resilient, those that have more women businesses um, that are operating. And so in Turkey, we, we've done some other things with our programs around helping to build resilience in the local, um, the local community. Part of it had to do with um, some of the, the, 
the aspects around the buildings and how they were constructed. Some of it had to do with empowering some of the local civil society. Some of it had to do with some other things. But it was a project we did in concert with many others. So, um, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the areas in which we've worked. And we've done that again. Um, my foundation, my foundation partners have done the majority of that work. They have a lot more of the details on it, but it's been something that in building resilience and building resilient communities that has been a priority of ours in the past and in the future. Um, well, on sort of along the same lines and, and I think connected to the gender issue somewhat is has UPS uh, taken any steps to support Afghan refugees in recent weeks? So we have, we've just signed on to and agreed to support. Um, we were one of 30 companies that agreed to support and to look at the um, hiring of Afghan refugees and made those commitments that we would be willing, you know, we are, we are going to be a part of that initiative to, to help out the, the Afghan refugee population. We've also been working with a lot of the humanitarian organizations again, who are, um, primarily working in the bordering countries around Afghanistan at the moment with regards to some of the humanitarian needs that we see. It's a, it's a challenging situation. There's not a lot of roads in Afghanistan, so everything has to fly in. So the air network is what's really important there. And that's, um, so that's something that we're looking at. Um, and I'll do one last audience question. Um, how, uh, how do the growing impacts from natural disasters and weather events caused by climate change affect the transition to cleaner forms of energy? What are the business decisions that UPS has to make to mitigate those impacts? Yeah, so I think climate resilience is a big question that a lot of um, a lot of companies as well as countries are looking at. So it's looking at your facilities, looking at you know, we, we, we operate an air network. So for us, you know, weather is a, weather can delay our air network delivers, it delays our services. And so those are things that we do look at in terms of that are important, but it, but it's also looking at, you know, Hurricane Ida recently came through Louisville or um, Louisiana and impacted some of our facilities in Louisiana. And that's something that we, you know, as part of what we look at in terms of our sustainability planning, that's something that I think we, we, we need to keep in mind. And it's something that all companies are looking at in terms of their climate resilience based on where are we building things today and how resilient are our things to that. At the same time, I'm, I'm building, having to build in resilience as I'm transitioned to new types of energy and new fleets. So for example, as we move to an all electric fleet, how do I make sure that I always have electricity or how do I have backup batteries to make sure that, that I can deliver my packages uh, on a daily basis to folks, even if there's a power outage, even if there's something else going on. So again, kind of making sure there's not a brittleness in our own internal supply chain, but that we're building in resilience and um, backup plans into our systems is incredibly important. Um, well, I really was looking forward to this conversation today because you have had such an interesting career uh, as a public policy major, as an economics major. Uh, we're sort of coming to the end of our time, but do you have any other last advice you want to offer our students or audience? Uh, my only, listen to Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> on, wow. to, on, on all the childcare, on all the women at work, <laughs> listen to Betsy. <laughs> Um, I, I really love that advice and I will make sure that I play the end of this, uh, for my children tonight. <laughs> and hopefully some of my students turned it, tuned in today. So, uh, <laughs> always great fun to be able to chat with you. Um, and I really appreciate you making the time to be our alumni in residence today. Well, thank well Betsy, thank you. And I think I've, uh, as a final comment, I would just say I, my children have listened to your podcast, so they're they're well on their way to being uh, uh, economics majors in the future. So thank you for everything you're doing to help educate the next generation on economics and economic theory. Thank you so much.